Hello everyone, my name is Robert Pratton and uh, I'm the founder and CEO of uh, Conductor and our mission is to make everyone's life an adventure. Now the reason we think this is a good idea is because through adventure people can achieve their full potential in life. And it's fantastic to uh, win such an award but I don't want you to think that uh, you know, I've single-handedly been able to sort of uh, do everything in order to sort of get, get in this position. There are nine of us in our company. Um, there's three people not pictured here who are our full-time developers. We're um, a software company, basically. That's what we sell. We license our software. Although, looking through this presentation, you might think we're a studio. So we're not a studio. We license our technology to other people, other creative people. Um, but it just so happens that often we get asked to create projects ourselves, but that's not our core reason for being. So this is our sort of like customer facing team, there's nine of us. This is us at work, uh, this is us at play. This is us playing while we should be working. Uh, this is us at play, this is our... Um, this is basically a Christmas photo, so every Christmas we go and do something fun, and this was an escape room uh, around the uh, Sherlock Holmes theme. This is us at work, but playing. So we're playing uh, a board game called Damage Report, and it's a collaborative game uh, in real time, so you don't have to wait for somebody else to make their move before you can make your move. And one of the reasons we play these games is to really analyze it after. We talk to each other about what we enjoyed and we try to think how can we incorporate some of what we've learned from playing this game into the interactive work that we create. And this is Natalie who looks like she's playing but she is actually at work. So UEFA uh, is one of our clients and um, we are in the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. It's a new... Uh, new football stadium uh, in North London. So I mentioned that um, our mission is to make everyone's life an adventure and the way that we do that is through um, combining all these things to create mixed reality experiences. So mixed reality is on this spectrum from purely digital, so purely synthetic worlds through to the real world and we tend to work down this augmented area where we're trying to um, create new realities but in the real world, in the, in, the, in the real physical space. And we do that by combining our technology with storytelling. So to give some uh, quick examples, this was a project that we did for the World Bank. So at Davos a couple of years ago, the World Bank organized this seminar with world leaders and there were 10 of these sort of physical boxes and each box represented somebody from a particular industry that would be affected by a pandemic. Now when you open the box, there are all kinds of physical artifacts from that person telling you a little bit about their life and the trouble that they're having right now because of a lack of pandemic preparation. But there's also a mobile phone. And when you pick up the phone, you dial the number, the speed dial number, our technology answers it, and that's the trigger for subsequently sending incoming phone calls and text messages. So it's a, very, it's a very sort of simple and small way to show how we're augmenting the physical space with a kind of digital reality elsewhere. So it's not complicated. Remember this was world leaders. We didn't expect they'd be able to use an iPad or anything like that. They've obviously got assistants that do that type of stuff. Uh, this is something on the other side of um, the mixed reality. So in the middle here is um, basically a computer game. It's a, it's a simulation using software that the armed forces use. And uh, using the game paddle, you can be a tank commander. And the idea is that you just had to drive around um, blowing up cars. But events from that game get transmitted to our technology and then we're generating uh, fake social media. So as you try to complete a mission in this synthetic world, we are telling you how the world is reacting or how that local area is reacting through this social media. Because in modern warfare, and I'll get onto this later, uh, especially if you're um, in a Western democracy, you still need to stand accountable to the public and there's actually a battle of narratives going on right now 
be t you know, between you and your adversaries. And I'll, cut, but I'll come on to that. So we've been around since about 2010 as a company, and we've done lots of projects in lots of different areas. But where I got started was back in something like 2008. And I read Henry Jenkins' book on convergence culture, and it really got me going and interested in um, transmedia storytelling. So transmedia storytelling is telling a story across multiple platforms, but doing so in a way that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And that's what this diagram um, is attempting to illustrate. Now, one of the problems with this diagram is it doesn't really um, help much for the type of participatory storytelling that I do. It's great if you're developing a franchise and you want to know how the book is going to kind of integrate with the movie or integrate with the game, but it doesn't really tell you about how people are going to interact with that world, and that's really my primary uh, interest. So we have other models, and this is, some ex this is sort of like one example of one of the models we use, and this is looking at how um, important are each of these four elements to the participatory experience that we're creating. So how important is story? the narrative, how important is gaming. So when you see gaming, think of that as we're giving the audience a challenge. So we're giving them something to accomplish um, or some sort of problem to overcome during that experience. And then how much is it in the real world versus how much in a kind of digital world? And how much is the audience co-creating this experience with me? So I'm going to give you an example. Um, so Kadancha is one of our clients. Uh, they're the world's largest manga publisher. So manga is like the Japanese comics. And uh, Attack on Titan is a very popular um, property, I guess you would call it, of theirs. So in the world of Attack on Titan, um, you've basically got youngsters that live within this walled village. And outside of the walled village are these massive giants, the Titans. And when the Titans get hungry, they eat the villagers. <laughs> so what happens is the youngsters in the village, they train in order to be able to tackle the titans. And the way that you kill the titans is by basically slicing with a sword on the, across the back of the neck. So what I'm showing here is a location-based um, experience. So for Anime Expo um, in Los Angeles, inside the actual conference area, um, it's very difficult to get Wi-Fi. So what we usually do is some kind of scavenger hunt based on text messages, just based on SMS. And that we took to be the training area, which was inside the village. Then outside of the conference area was outside of the walled village where you could attack Titans. So um, basically, you would load up our, um, our app, and it would show you where the Titans were that you could go and approach to kill. So when you got in the vicinity of a Titan, you could, uh, something like this would pop up, and it would show a little swiping pattern that you had to then copy in order to kill the, kill the Titan. And what's interesting about this, I think, is that in all of our work, we try to um, you know, be true to the world of the, of the story. We try to think, how do we translate you know, what, um, what we've been given and putting it into a real participatory experience and make it something additive? Now, with a, it happens um, quite often. When you work on a well-known property like this, you can't actually um, create any story because the, um, the owners of the property are concerned that you might inadvertently introduce something into their canon, which they then have to justify or sort of like, you know, live with forevermore. So this was a purely game, even though we're taking elements from the, from the world. I think one of the key things... Um, for us, it was interesting, uh, Kyle, earlier, when he was talking about the way he designed um, the, uh, the credit, the, the uh, movie titles, was that, that he would start with a particular moment or particular image and then create another image and move on. And that's pretty much how we think about creating um, participatory transmedia experiences. It's how do we go from moment to moment? So what is a moment? So a moment is when you're fully engaged in um, that activity or fully engaged in that experience. And 
when you're creating something in the real world, obviously there's lots of distractions. So I found that this uh, diagram is quite useful for thinking about um, engagement and immersion. So uh, the people that came up with this diagram identified three different types of immersion. Challenge-based, so that's when you're working through to find a solution to a problem. It's like gaming, you might consider that. Um, sensory immersion, which is basically using our senses. I would call that spectacle. So when you've got some sort of like amazing video, some amazing graphic, something audible. Um, and then imaginative immersion is the narrative the storytelling. So what we would often try to do is combine all three of them so that you get like a triple effect of everything piling up at the same time to make it really um, immersive. Now what, um, what we try to do in our work, the reason we want it to be immersive is we want you to be transported to a different world even if you're standing like physically here today or sitting in an office space somewhere. So although we started, um, although we started our business working in, in the entertainment space, and for example in Spain we work with Canal Plus, and um, we turned the whole of Spain into Westeros for um, I think it was like season three of the Game of Thrones. Um, but what we typically do these days is we build crisis simulations for large companies. So large companies um, want to be sure that they're prepared for events which they hope will never happen, but might. So for example, um, a marauding gunman. So in America, it's sadly too frequently that someone will come in with a gun, often an ex-employee, and start shooting people. So they want to be prepared for that. How do we, how do, we do that? But it's also things like hurricanes, um, uh, pandemics, and such like. And so what we, what we do with our software is we recreate those um, we recreate those events so that people can role play and rehearse those situations so they're better prepared in the future. And often they've got all kinds of other things on their mind about you know the job that you should be doing rather than playing a game, going through this sort of crisis simulation. So being in the moment um, is really uh, a key thing to do. And having entered this world, this kind of corporate um, environment from the entertainment industry, we offer something different to that space, but we also learn something from them as well about the things that are happening in their world. And what I want to do is I just want to look at some recent things that I feel have been inspired by transmedia storytelling, which um, is worth being aware of, really. So how many people are familiar with Cambridge Analytica? Just have a show of hands. Okay, so not so many, but uh, the people who I thought might be familiar with it are, and most people aren't. So Cambridge Analytica, you could think of as a digital agency whose clients were political parties or politicians. And the reason that they came into the news is because they developed a Facebook app that was used to psychometrically profile people, and then knowing someone's psychometric profile to deliver certain political messages to them to encourage them to vote in a particular way. So that kind of influence, um, although I think a lot of people find that distasteful because they don't like the idea that we can all be manipulated, but most people um, are actually sheep <laughs> and they will follow um, the crowd. And the other thing that um, what we know is that in the past, with, let's say, propaganda, you would want to convince somebody that they are wrong. But that's not what people do now. What you need to do is convince people that they are right. So what you do is you find people whose views you think are similar to the direction you want to go, and then you basically block out all the other opposing views so that they just live in this tiny, narrow universe where everything agrees with them and they develop an unshakable belief that they're right and then they start to share all your messages uh, and so on for, them and for you. And people are much likely to believe a message that's been shared by a friend or someone else that they respect than if it comes directly from the party. So this is very um, 
sort of worrying in a way, and I'll come back onto that. So in the in the advertising space, this is um, uh, this was a campaign um, that was developed by the World Wildlife uh, Fund to bring attention to um, the number of uh, elephants that are being killed for their tusks. So what they've done is they've created a fictional company that profits from ivory. And then what they do is they say, right, this is like a hand grenade or a stick of dynamite. I'm going to light it. Who, who's going to find this absolutely abhorrent? And I'm going to throw that grenade into that community and watch them light up with anger. And then that's going to be a much more effective way to carry my message so that people start talking about this horrible company that are killing, are killing elephants and so on. But it never really existed. But it's a really effective way to get a conversation uh, started. And what we find these days as well, that um, there was a report written by uh, NATO um, to try to educate people to, to develop this media illiteracy around the fact that foreign governments are trying to sow dis discord and discomfort and um, basically upheaval in our, in our countries through social media, but also through sort of traditional broadcast television. So Russia Today, for example, is intended to create a counter-narrative to whatever the official narrative or what most people believe at that time. So it's really, um, it's really worrying, but in the, same, uh, in the same sense, it's kind of like always been here. It was John Lennon that said, nothing is real. And I think the thrust of this pre presentation is that reality is whatever you choose to believe it to be. And we use that in our storytelling. And in fact, when, you know, as filmmakers, you're actually pointing the camera in a particular direction. You're choosing to show a window on a particular um, part of the world. You're not committing to someone that you will show them the whole world, just your world. And we're trying to do this the same as well through our experiences. We don't have the privilege of only having a single lens because we're telling experience, we're creating experiences that play out in the world around us. So we use different techniques. But this is one example of something where we do, um, we are able to control a window. So, um, so <laughs> this is Maria. So we have a relationship with the University of Granada. So Maria joined us as an intern one summer, and we really liked her, so we hired her. So now she's working, uh, working with part of the team, and she's here running an exercise which is called a war game. So we have a blue team and a red team. It's an Arctic conflict. And they can only see what's on their particular screen. But because she's in the exercise control area, she can see both realities. So in this particular situation, the reality that's being seen by either team is quite different. And what we want to do is see how they basically compete against each other. This is a much more fun uh, example. So these people with headphones, they're standing, they're standing in um, Trafalgar Square. And someone is telling them a story, but they're, telling, they're pointing out to them different actors that are in that public space. So you've got, you've got the regular public who are completely unaware that actors are putting on a performance. And basically, you've got two realities side by side. One which is just going about its usual business of being in Trafalgar Square, and the other which is being guided by the audio in their headphones. So um, Disney are opening this big Star Wars land, and I saw that they've got this mobile app, which adds yet another dimension to that physical space. So you can walk around the physical space and get one level of appreciation, or you can use this mobile app and tune in to different things. You can scan the walls. So it's introducing another level of reality. So I don't know if anyone's seen this. Um, basically, this woman is wearing... Um, a virtual reality headset, and she's eating synthetic food. But the, what they're trying to do is trick her senses into thinking that that food is something different from the actual thing she puts in her mouth. So she might be looking at a big strawberry or something, and then they'll be pumping out the smell of strawberries, but she eats some sort of tiny little bit of plastic or something. And what this company's trying to do is like augment food. They're trying to create food that never really existed in the real world by designing it in a particular particular way. 
So it's a completely alternative reality that never existed, and it only exists for that person with a headset on that's, that's tasting it, because what you see from your perspective will be completely different. So I don't know if anybody's... Did anybody go to Venice to see um, this exhibition from Damien Hirst? Okay. So on, I'll play this short video. It's like the trailer, because there's a documentary which is on Netflix. And uh, I don't know. It's a little bit tricky to see, but basically there are divers unearthing these uh, artifacts from the bottom of the ocean. So, let's go on. So what's supposed to have happened is that this ship was carrying a lot of uh, sculpture and other artifacts and I think it sinks in the Mediterranean. And I don't know if you can see on this picture, but there's like a cutaway of the boat. And inside it's showing how all those artifacts were carried in the boat. And then you can actually see those um, exhibits. So in that top uh, left-hand corner, there's a lion with a woman next to it. And that is the woman with the lion. So it's all covered in these barnacles and everything. Now what's really interesting about this is it's all completely fake. It's a massive art collection, and what Damon Hurst has done is created this massive, believable story world around all these artifacts. And when you see it, the scale of it is enormous. So they've taken over like large parts of Venice with these huge sculptures, like this one. So you go in, this is like several stories tall, you're looking up at this. And just... It's not just the size of the pieces, but the number of pieces as well. And the, the gallery is a bit like a museum. You know if you go in a museum and you see all the different sizes of coins and different sort of like earrings and uh, things that you, they might have uncovered. He's cre recreated all of those things, and it's completely fictional. And it's so immersive that you really want to believe it, which, which sort of brings me on to this point that often in this sort of line of work, people um, will use the phrase um, suspension of disbelief. But I much uh, prefer the phrase by um, uh, Janet Murray, which is the active creation of belief. So you're allowing people to sort of enter that world, particularly if it's like a, a fictional world that they're, f that they're familiar with, like the Game of Thrones or Harry Potter or something. So you're giving them reasons and ways into that world to imagine that things really did exist. So this is another British uh, artist called Banksy. So Banksy is uh, traditionally known as a graffiti artist. And he created basically a cynical version of Disneyland, and it's called Dismalland. So in the UK, um, you know, it used to be popular for people to sort of go to the seaside, to go to these types of uh, places. But um, since there's been cheap flights, everyone would much sooner come to Spain, where um, you know, the weather's better, the people are nice, and you even do all-day breakfast. So there's just no need to stay in, uh, in British seaside towns, and they're quite sort of desolate now, and they have big sort of problems. And Banksy's trying to recreate his memories of going to these um, sort of theme parks. So when you first go in, um, all this security equipment is, is made out of cardboard and paper, so it's all completely phony, and there's an actor there that goes through this sort of like mock, sort of immersive theatre piece. And um, this is the welcome desk. <laughs> so it's actually like an ice cream van, and the wheels are missing. And the person in there is kind of like, yeah. You know, like, it's, so it's really, it's funny on one, on, in one side because um, it's a parody of what you thought. But there's also some serious messages there as well. So I don't know if you've ever used, or if they're popular in Spain, these, um, uh, they're like remote controlled boats. So you have like a little paddle area and you have to control the boat. So Banksy recreated this, but this time with a load of refugees all packed into the boat trying to get to the land. So he's using it all the time to create these sort of like, um, like a kind of resonance really to get you to uh, connect with it. And it's, it's all about a parallel reality. So this is um, a caravan, 
and it's on this sort of spindle. So you go in there, you put the seatbelt on, and then it spins like this. So you sort of tumble over and over inside the caravan. Uh, my favourite was this, pocket money loans. So this is getting youngsters to get into debt as early as possible. And um, just like the payday loans, you can get, uh, it's never too early to get into debt. <laughs> and what, so I looked around this place. Uh, I looked around this sort of like store area, and I found this, which absolutely speaks to transmedia. So you can get multicoloured bits of plastic. I'm going to zoom in to two halves of this. So it says, multicoloured bits of plastic and their journey to a landfill of a thousand years. And it's given them all these like, you know, silly names. And it says, they probably have different personalities and different abilities. And it, you know, that's exactly what you would do if you were going to create this kind of story world with all these different things. And at the bottom, you know, it's still cynical saying, you know, in the battle between all these different pieces of plastic, there can only be one winner, and that's the toy manufacturer. So, you know, what is realism? I mean, how do, you know, often when you, when you create a project, someone says, I want it to be realistic. I want it to be, you know, okay, yeah, I know it's fictional, but I want it to be realistic. So we look at it um, through these two different sort of lenses. So you can talk about the fidelity. So how, um, how similar is it? How does it look? At, look and feel? How does it behave um, compared to the real thing? And then you've got the analogy, which is, okay, maybe it doesn't look and feel like the real thing, but does it invoke the similar sort of emotions? Does it create um, the right type of experience which is transferable to the real thing? So to help me illustrate this, um, so teen pregnancy Barbie should really belong in the should really belong in the other in, in the other uh, section, but um, it was a good segue into this. So um, there are these schemes that are trying to uh, prevent teenage pregnancies, and what they do is they get young uh, women to carry around a baby, and they have to look after it for a week or so many days. And the idea is that they get a real taste of reality, so they get from their mind what might be a romantic idea of having a baby, and they see what a pain in the backside it is. So if you look here, I mean, you could have just given her a bag of potatoes to carry around, but instead of which, it's a doll, it's ethnically similar to her, so that's on the fidelity side. They're thinking about how realistic does it really need to be. But presumably, it doesn't smell like a real baby, it doesn't have real hair like a real baby, it looks like a plastic thing because they want to create the experience that um, to focus on all the, the chewers. So it definitely cries like a real baby, and it definitely wets itself like a real baby, so you have to sort of replace. So it's, it's trying to give her an experience to put her off rushing into this too early when she should be out playing with her friends rather than sitting at home nursemaid in this thing. So taking it over into some work that we've done recently, um, this was a project that we did uh, for Visa, and it's to um, teach youngsters uh, practical finance skills. So what you do at the beginning is you have a short introductory video which sets up these two characters, and they are YouTubers. And the challenge is to make a video within three days, but during the course of trying to create that video, you um, you encounter lots of different setbacks and you have to use financial skills in order to get over those sort of challenges. So right at the beginning, you have to choose one of these players. And the reason you've got a choice is because we want the player to identify with the, with the sort of the character they, they feel most closely towards, you see. Now, in true transmedia storytelling style, you will get a different perspective on the story if you play either of these characters. So it is replayable. You can play as Alex and then go back and play as Jess. But once you're in, you get a virtual desktop where you have like this kind of fake WhatsApp channel. You've got fake email. There's even a fake bank account. So you can transfer money not only between savings and check-in, but you can also transfer money between other students in the same classroom. So you can give loans to people in order for them to achieve their objectives, for example. 
So a lot of this um, is thinking about the fidelity. You know, how do we make it look like a real life experience of getting emails from parents, um, maybe trying to get a job uh, to get extra money, this type of thing. But we also have to think about the um, the learning experience. Like, what is the takeaway knowledge? And I've illustrated that with this um, basic like assistant that's inside the inside the app. Now, when I started, I think I was quite a purist in terms of trying to make everything as realistic as possible. But if ever someone is confused, they're completely not in the moment at all. And so by introducing some of these sort of um, sort of like out of world aspects to guide the players or to coach them a little bit through the game, it's although you lose a little bit of fidelity, you gain on the sort of analogy side because you're highlighting to them what they should be focusing on. And often we try to still do it within the story world. So my is this robotic assistant and most people would have an assistant on their phone as we saw from the last presentation. So that's where, so that's where that comes. And I think when you make, um, I'm just gonna check the time. I think when you make choices um, about your types of experiences, I would say um, it's quite okay to use artistic license. And I wanted to illustrate that with this picture from Van Gogh. So these trees probably never existed like that. But what he wants you to do is experience that place the way that he experienced it. So he's using an artistic license to sell you a particular mood or, or to put you into a certain sort of mind state. And this is the way that we've been developing our transmedia stories, not worried all the time to the exclusion of everything else about how realistic it is. But it just needs to be, it just needs the right level of fidelity. And then we use this artistic license. So I'll just check. So I've got a little bit more time. So I, was, I, I had it here with like a, a break if I needed it. So making it happen. So how do, you, how do you bring this together and what have we been looking at? So online, you'll be able to find this active story system. And it's basically our methodology for breaking down what might be a client's requirements into what you need to do to create an engaging experience. And it's the active story system is focused predominantly on the on the experience, but it also covers off things like project management and organization. Because the experiences that we create, they run on in the real world, so they have to be serviced. There's a, like a service level agreement between us and the client for them to be able to continue running it. And when we're looking at designing the world, we look at, you know, where are the locations, what are the factions, who are the, who are the, what are the things that we're going to encounter as we go through that world. But one of the um, models that occupies us uh, quite a bit is looking at how much automation versus live role play is there and how much of it is scripted and how much of it is uh, moderated or in this big sandbox. So when we're designing an experience, it's um, a conversation really between us and the client about what type of experience they want. And if I can give some sort of corporate examples. So in the, on the left-hand side there, I'm showing an individual learning experience. So it's scripted and um, it's self-paced and it's automated. And typically this will be because you've got thousands of people running through this um, experience and it's very expensive to provide role players for everyone. So a role player is like another player, but it's, some, it's someone that's, you know, pretending to be a machine or pretending to be a fictional character, but it's really a human. So I mentioned before, like big companies, they have these uh, crisis teams and they also have a business continuity team. So business continuity is, let's say more like everyday situations that go wrong. So if you're Ford and you're manufacturing, is Ford still in Valencia? So you're Ford and you're waiting for parts to come in and something happens like there's some sort of dispute and they can't, the ferries can't come in with the parts. That's a business continuity issue. And then you need to decide, okay, that production line needs to keep running. Where do we get the other parts from? And so to do that type of experience, you can pretty much automate a lot of it because there is a procedure. Someone has thought in advance about what they're going to do if should that happen. And what you're doing here is you're testing the plan. Whereas in crisis management, you're testing the people. So with crisis management, 
it's much more like unexpected things. Things get out of control, and we need the team that comes in to do that to be able to talk to each other, to work to each other, because often they work in other parts of the business. They're not used to working together. So they come together. They might have different levels of seniority, and that creates all kind of conflicts in the team. And it's much better to rehearse one of these incidents and go through that before you have to do the real thing. So when we're talking about, so because this tends to be much more executive sort of level, um, this is why we would use real role players. So we'll have role players who are playing politicians or environment ministers or whoever it might be. And they can have like a live sort of conversation with them to really get them into it. So when we're looking at designing these types of um, experiences, most of what we do now is less automated and more kind of um, participatory with role players and with players interacting with other players. So this diagram shows the story world and the individual stories, but the stories that we work with are ones that are emergent, stories that grow out of the of what the players are doing, the choices that they make. So we don't really know in advance where that story is going to branch and where it's going to go to. So what we try to do is identify what the story world elements are and make those available so that as the story goes in a particular direction, we can bring up those story world elements and throw them in. So I'm re this diagram was drawn for a different reason, but it kind of illustrates what I'm doing. So let's say you were going to do a James Bond story. You would have casinos, um, you know, special weapons, um, bow ties, um, beautiful women, rugged men. That would all be part of the James Bond story world. The Harry Potter story world would be full of wizards, wands. So you know ahead of time what the story world is and what makes up that story world, and you can call upon them. And one of the things that's one of the things that's been sort of troubling us that we've been sort of working on is how to create these participatory worlds that don't break. So to allow um, the players a lot of freedom, but not go so far as allowing them for freedom to break it. So if you play um, a computer game, say if you played like Fallout 4 or Fallout 76 or something, in a digital world, what the game designer will do is like build a mountain range or they'll have a river that you can't swim across. So there'll be ways to tell you that you can't go any further in that particular direction. It can be confusing. So um, if you play Red Dead Redemption, I can swim in that. And then if you start playing Days Gone, I can't. So I started to swim across the lake and drowned. So um, that's, that's much easier to do in the digital domain than it is in the real world. And we've been looking at this idea of elastic story worlds. So allowing the world to bend a little the way the players want, but if we're going to achieve our overall objective, our overall goal of you know, whatever the learning or the, um, the takeaway from the experience is, we need to find ways to sort of send them back. And what we've come up with is this method of, so most people um, that design scenarios, that look at scenario planning, they'll identify two axes of uncertainty. And I'm showing here like someone that needs to set up an effective quarantine. So there's two ways that this could go, <laughs> more or less. Basically, there is an effective quarantine in place for a pandemic, and they have good communication, or there's going to be bad communication. So if you end up down in this quadrant, then there's a breakdown of social order, the, 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 the pandemic is spreading, and where you want to be is in up in that top. So what we're doing is saying, OK, let the players make their choices, and then as the humans, or as the human expert, where is this going? And then activate in different pieces of content to send them that feedback. And if they go too far in a particular direction, then we're sending the content much faster. It's much more kind of um, punitive than it would be if they'd made a tiny step in the wrong direction. And this is what we've uh, been developing. In This is like um, the editing software for our technology. So what we're able to do is work with this type of grid. I'm showing a different exercise here. And we're putting in this, this content, which is scripted, but it's also dynamic. And we're using lots of variables. So you can very quickly um, change the story world based on what the player's choices are. So it's quite unique, um, and it's quite ambitious, but we're almost there. And it's been a lot of fun. So this is my closing thought, is basically 
this whole presentation is tried to say that reality is whatever you believe it to be. And as creators, it's whatever you want your audience to believe it to be. Thank you very much.